Good evening. My name is Olivia and I'm an event manager here at Town Hall. And on behalf of Town Hall Seattle, um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation featuring cutting edge research by University of Washington students, Lauren Sarkisian, Christina Biarvin, and Arena Manning. This is the third of uh, five events in the UW Engage Science series. And we are so pleased to be able to once again offer this platform for these students and their important and engaging work. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We are so glad to have you join us. Tonight's three presentations will run about 60 minutes in total, followed by Q&A. To submit your questions for the Q&A portion, please enter meet.ps slash 5-9 UW Engage. Uh, you'll be able to see that on your screen, so I won't repeat it. Um, but there's also a link in the chat, um, and you can um, access that link at any time to um, ask questions of any of our presenters. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, um, but you can help by keeping your questions concise. Also, a reminder that if you'd like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Visit our website to view our calendar of upcoming events and sign up for our e-newsletter to receive updates as future events are added this season. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. As part of our Arno G. Matulski Science Lectures Series, this event is supported by Microsoft. Town Hall is also a member supported organization and I'd like to thank all of our members who are joining us if you share their belief that our community is energized and inspired by considering questions of politics, science and culture, I hope you'll consider membership too. There is information on our website. And now I would like to introduce our first speaker. Lauren Sarkissian is an epidemiology student who will receive her Master of Public Health in spring 2022. Um, just a second. Uh, she has spent her time at the University of Washington studying improved diagnostics for tuberculosis within the Cangelosi lab. Her unique experience of studying infectious disease during, the, during a pandemic makes her eager for an exciting career in public health. Please join me in welcoming Lauren Sarkissian. Thanks so much for that introduction. I'm really excited to share my talk with you. Um, hopefully you're seeing everything okay and I will go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so I'm going to start this talk with a fun icebreaker that goes in one sentence, can you describe your job poorly, uh, which always makes me laugh because for me this game is really easy. Um, I put things in my mouth for science and by things I mean long q tip like swabs that you can see pictured here. In science class you're told that you cannot and you should not put things in your mouth because it's dangerous and they're right in nearly 99% of cases, um, because in my lab, things are different. Um, so I work as a research scientist at the University of Washington, where part of my job is looking cool in lab coats. And the other part is researching diagnostics, which is the science of figuring out who has what diseases. And I personally do this by swabbing tongues. People who work in diagnostics are a lot like detectives because they both have similar goals to figure out what went wrong at the scene of the crime and help ensure that it doesn't happen again. Albeit in diagnostics, the criminals are bacteria and viruses and the crime scenes are sicknesses. But just like detectives, people who study diagnostics use different tools to figure out what's making someone sick. Just like a detective might use a magnifying glass to find fingerprints, a diagnostician can use machines to find pieces of bacterial DNA or cells inside someone's body. So how does this process work? How does a disease detective investigate the crime scene of our illnesses? Well, they need to collect evidence, right? Which means a sample has to be collected from the body. So this could be collecting mucus from the nose with a swab like we do for COVID-19 testing, uh, urine in a cup like we do for sexually transmitted infection testing, uh, a blood test, which we collect with a needle, or we can even collect phlegm, which can be coughed up into a cup like we do for tuberculosis diagnostics. Um, and so once we've collected these samples, the diagnosticians run tests to try and figure out what germ is making us sick. And the goal is to correctly diagnose everyone. We want the people who are sick to test positive, and we want the people who are not sick to test negative. But the problem is that 
not all tests are 100% accurate. And so we have problems with misdiagnosis. So occasionally people who are sick will test negative and people who are not sick will test positive, which is a really big problem, right? Um, because that means people who need treatment will not know they need treatment. And people who don't need treatment might take medicine they don't need, which can be equally as harmful. Yeah, so not good. Um, so false positives and false negatives on tests can be extremely harmful, like I said before. Um, and you can think about it like this. Think about a false positive on a test, like a fire alarm that sounds, um, but there's no actual fire. So the fire department comes to your house, hoses it down for no reason, and so the house suffers damage and you're wasting resources in the process. You know, the firefighters came out, the water soaks down your house and nothing was really going on. So, um, taking medications you don't need kind of has a similar effect. Uh, why treat something that doesn't need to be treated altogether? Um, and a false negative on a test is like a house fire that isn't detected by alarm. Um, the house is burning up, but little or no, no action is taken, or maybe the wrong action is taken to address it. Um, so just like when you're sick, you want to get on a treatment plan to put out fires appropriately. Um, so it's really important that diagnosticians create tests that are as accurate as possible to avoid false positives and false negatives. So as a disease detective, it's super important that when we investigate someone's illness, we get it right. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the tools I use to investigate my criminal, which is tuberculosis. So tuberculosis, also called TB, is caused by a bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, TB is the second leading cause of death due to infectious disease globally, with COVID-19 currently being number one. So before um, the emergence of COVID, TB was the number one leading cause of death due, inf due to infectious disease globally. So just like COVID, uh, TB is a respiratory disease that is spread person to person through tiny droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And symptoms of TB include night sweats, fever, bloody phlegm, persistent cough, it gets better, chest pain or shortness of breath. Um, and these symptoms can be really mild at first. So people don't always know that there is a bigger problem at hand, which is really problematic because in that uh, time, they are also spreading TB to other people. Um, and not only that, but they're delaying getting treatment. So that's a big problem. Um, in terms of where TB is distributed across the globe, it, as you can see, it occurs everywhere, but so in some places more than others. Um, so areas that are under-resourced, um, that have high rates of other medical conditions like HIV or malnutrition um, are areas where TB is higher. So as you can see on this map, the colors in the light blue are areas with less TB and the colors in the dark blue are areas with more TB. A total of 1.5 million people died from TB in 2020. And that is scary uh, in and of itself. But what's scarier is that tuberculosis is becoming resistant to antibiotics because people won't finish their medicines. Um, so that's really scary as well. Um, so for my research specifically, I'm looking at uh, tuberculosis in South Africa, which as you can see is here in the dark blue. Um, so it's a really high uh, area of TB for men. So the good news about TB is it's treatable with antibiotics. And you may have taken antibiotics before, maybe for a week, maybe for a month. And you know that if you're on antibiotics, you have to complete the entire course of antibiotics, even if you start to feel better, which can be really hard to do, especially the longer you take them. For TB treatment, the course of antibiotics can last six to nine months, uh, which is a really long time to be on antibiotics. So the longer you take the pills, um, not only does it get harder to remember to take them, but you also may be inclined to stop taking them if you feel better. Um, but this can cause antibiotic resistance, which can cause TB infections to come back uh, worse and can kill people. So that's a really big problem. Um, and to make this even worse, people diagnosed with TB often have to be on a standard four different antibiotics to start out. So it can get really hard to manage really quickly, which is why treatment failure is so common. So it's really important to be able to diagnose people with TB so they can get on treatment and make sure that once they're on treatment, their antibiotics are working effectively. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about diagnosing TB. 
the way we currently diagnose and monitor the treatment course for tuberculosis is to have somebody cough out gunk from deep within their lungs that we can investigate. This gunk is called sputum or phlegm. Sorry, I'm going to be saying phlegm a lot in this talk. Uh, my apologies. Um, and the reason we use this phlegm is because of how many TB bacteria are likely to be in it. Because TB is a respiratory disease, we find all the TB bacteria in this gunk. Um, and so basically the procedure works by having somebody cough really hard into a cup, um, you know, which is not very fun if you've ever had to do that or if you've ever been hacking before, it's just not, not super great. Um, and also this is the standard way to diagnose tuberculosis. So if you are having a hard time spontaneously doing this yourself, you have to be medically assisted to, which involves a process where you inhale a fine saltwater like mist which breaks up any of the residual phlegm uh, in there and makes you cough it out um, forcefully, essentially. And basically this procedure feels about as good as it sounds. It uh, feels about like inhaling pool water. Um, so that's not great. And also this process is really dangerous because it exposes healthcare workers to respiratory diseases, you know, like COVID-19, like tuberculosis. So all around not great. But there is a reason that it, it is what they call the gold standard in diagnostics. So once this phlegm is collected, diagnosticians look inside it to see if there are living TB cells, uh, which tells us whether or not a person has tuberculosis. And the reason that it's done is it's really highly accurate. So people who are sick um, do test positive by these tests. But unfortunately, another huge drawback is that it takes up to four weeks to provide a diagnostic result, which is crazy. Imagine if you took a COVID test and you had to wait a month to get your results back. It's dangerous and it's frustrating and you wanna make decisions about your life, you know, knowing what your disease status is. So this is a problem, right? There has got to be a better way. Um, and there is, we're working on it. Um, so I'm gonna return back to this slide and tell you a little bit more about my research. Um, so basically uh, what we argue is that people with tuberculosis, when they cough, they cough up a little bit of that phlegm into their mouth. And so we're thinking that maybe we can swab their mouths, get a little bit of the DNA and bacteria that's been deposited onto the oral cavity in the tongue um, to see if TB is there and thus diagnose somebody. Um, and so there's many pieces to this research, like what kind of swabs do you use? How do you get the cells and the DNA off of the swab? What tests do you run on it? Um, what are the effects of antibiotics? So there's a lot of work to do in this field with tongue swabs too, specifically. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about how tongue swabbing works. And as promised, I'm gonna do a live demo. So this is a Copan flock swab, you know, this is the long Q-tip. And I'm gonna open it up. Probably should open it up on the right side. <laughs> um, and I won't be telling you how to do it as I'm doing it because that would sound silly, but essentially you just open it up, you take it out, here you can see it, um, and you will roll it around your tongue for about uh, 10 seconds, so. Just like that, super easy, painless, fast. And then I'm gonna stick it into this little tube of liquid and oh, break it off. And there you go. Obviously, if this was a real swab, a real clinical sample, and I was at risk of tuberculosis, I would be using gloves. Um, but because this is a demo, I don't need to be doing that. Um, but as you can see, I did it right here. It's really easy, it's fast, um, and I'm not coughing anything up, uh, which is good for both me and for you listening. Um, so once we have this swab that's in the little tube, we have to look for something on it, right? So if I was a person that potentially could have had tuberculosis, we're gonna look on the swab for TB bacteria or even more specifically TB DNA. So tuberculosis is a bacteria um, and bacteria are organisms just like humans are. Um, and you know, TB has DNA just like we do. Uh, granted, there's a world of difference between us and TB, but we both have unique genetic codes. And this knowledge makes us able to locate TB DNA um, and thus 
help us diagnose somebody. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how this DNA detection process works. Essentially, we need to get the DNA off of the swab and process it and prepare it for a DNA test. And no, not like a 23andMe test, there's no ancestry involved. Um, we're gonna be running a PCR test, which is essentially is a machine that tells us whether or not TB is in our sample. So let's get into the details. How do we get the DNA ready? First, I take the tongue swabs out of the freezer and I thaw them on ice. Then I place them in, place the samples in this little heat bath um, that makes them safe to work with. So it's a really important first step. And essentially the process of boiling them opens up the TB cells and releases the DNA kind of into the mixture, um, which is you know, important because we have to get the DNA outside of the cells uh, for it to be detected. Then we use a DNA extraction kit that has a number of different chemicals that we use to further separate out the DNA from different parts of the cell. So once the DNA and the cell parts are floating in the solution, we have to get the DNA all by itself because we're only interested in finding the DNA. So we do this by spinning the solution through a column that traps all the DNA inside and removes basically all the other parts of the cell in, in the flow through. Um, and so once all this debris is removed, then we have the DNA and we can remove it from the filter. So the second to last preparation step is to concentrate the DNA, which helps it to better be detected by the PCR machine. Um, and then we have to actually prepare it for the PCR itself. So we add a bunch more chemicals and prepare it for the PCR reaction. So then we run the actual DNA test, the PCR. So what is PCR? Uh, we've heard a lot about PCR recently with COVID. And yes, it's the same kind or similar kind of PCR, um, you know, used to detect SARS-CoV-2 to diagnose COVID-19. So this is a similar idea. Um, so we, if we know the genetic code for an organism, we're able to use this PCR machine um, to look for said organism essentially. So because we know the sequence of TB DNA, we can make little primers uh, that match the TB DNA. And these primers quite literally prime the reaction to happen if it finds the DNA it's looking for. And if it does this, it'll send a signal to the computer that the TB DNA was found. Um, and if it doesn't find the TB DNA, the computer will not get a signal. And so after this reaction runs, and you know, potentially TB is detected, we get a signal, we diagnose somebody with tuberculosis. Or if TB is not detected, the person is hypothetically not uh, TB positive. Um, so based on this reaction and the readout of the machine, we can determine whether or not somebody has uh, tuberculosis. Um, and like anything, there are def different pros and cons to this method. Um, and swabbing in general. And one of the things we talked about already is how fast it is, especially compared to the four week turnaround um, that the other kinds of testing take. So it's relatively rapid and you get a really quick diagnostic result. Obviously there's the healthcare worker safety we talked about and it's well tolerated. You saw me do it here uh, live for you. So it's, you know, would have been worse if I had to cough something out of my lungs. Um, um, but, you know, like anything, it's not perfect. And there's a reason that these aren't widely implemented globally yet. And that's because it's not always accurate. So this method can be really prone to false positives and false negatives. Um, so there's a lot of research to go in terms of making this test uh, more accurate because we want to be sure that people are being diagnosed correctly. Um, and this research and these tests obviously require trained lab technicians, which can be a con um, being resource intensive as well. Um, but even though DNA testing can be inaccurate and has problems, um, sometimes it might still be worth it because of all the pros. And so that's why we're trying to work on optimizing this method to get it into use. Um, currently, we actually are running DNA tests that are kind of comparable on sputum, but, and we're trying to see how DNA testing on swabs compares to DNA testing on sputum to see, is it about the same? Is it better? And so far we're seeing that, um, swabs are comparable, if not better, to DNA testing done on sputum, which means that we can incorporate the use of swabs as like a safer diagnostic tool. Um, but there's still a ways to go. So in terms of impact, you know, I'm just gonna circle back to some things we talked about already. You know, tongue swabbing is much faster and easier than having people cough up phlegm, which means we can test a lot of people more quickly and in higher volumes. 
uh, which means we find cases of TB sooner and reduce transmission. Um, and tongue swab DNA detection methods are fast and they provide swift diagnostics, which means that we'll be able to use it to monitor people on treatment potentially. And this helps ensure that people are getting better and not developing antibiotic resistant or recurring infections. So with more research, tongue swabs will help revolutionize tuberculosis diagnostics. This will help us find more TB cases and prevent them from spreading to others, as well as getting people on more effective treatment more quickly. Um, and like I said, we still have to iron out some kinks uh, before tongue swabs can be implemented on a mass scale. Um, but for now, you should put things in your mouth when the disease detective tells you to. It just might save your life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, my name is Kevin Bishop, and I am a PhD student at the University of Washington and the instructor for this year's Engage Science Communication course. Um, and after that great presentation by Lauren, it is my pleasure to now introduce our next speaker of the evening, Christina Biarvin, who is a graduate student and researcher at the University of Washington School of Environmental Forest Sciences, working and studying in the Center for International Trade of Forest Products Lab. Christina's research focuses on how constructing tall buildings out of wood can help us fight climate change. Please join me in welcoming Christina Biarvin. Thanks, Kevin. I apologize for the cats screaming in the background. They'll probably be doing that uh, quite a bit. They're just cheering me on. So I want you to imagine that you're approached by a team of scientists. And these scientists have built a time machine, a time machine that will go forward 100 years into the future so that you can go and see what we've done right and see what we've done wrong as, in, as a culture, as a society and then report back with the results so we can make any changes and correct anything that might go wrong. And they're offering you a lot of money and you need to pay your student loans somehow. So you accept and you step into their time machine, you buckle yourself in, you press a big red button and you're launched off a hundred years into the future. And as you're barreling in towards the future that you're headed into, you start to know, you take a look around outside the windows and you notice things look quite a bit different than they did a hundred years ago. Water is scarce and drought is pervasive throughout the landscape. Natural, uh, natural disasters like wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes have been devastating the landscape and devastating the natural resources. Crops are failing and hunger is abundant. Communities are going hungry. And as you reach the city that your time machine is programmed to land in, it looks a little something like this. And as you're looking around at all this devastation, you're feeling really grateful that there's a return button on your time machine. And so you go back into 2022, you tell the scientists what you saw and they publish their results. And the results get picked up by news outlets, they start trending on social media. And for once, our policymakers decide to actually agree on something. And a bunch of climate change legislation is passed and greenhouse gas emissions like carbon dioxide are capped and our natural resources are protected. And to make sure that we're doing everything right, the scientists decide to send you back into the future uh, to see that everything worked out. And so this time, as you're headed back into the future and you buckle into your time machine, you're, you're nervous for what you're about to see. Your, your palms are sweating and your heart is racing, kind of like mine is as I'm giving this talk. And you look out the window in anticipation to see if we actually got things right this time. As you look out, things are much different but in a good way. Water is abundant and flowing across the landscape and all the places it used to be. Our natural resources are well protected and in good health. Food is abundant and hunger is a thing of the past. Our communities are well fed. And as you approach the previous city that was uh, plagued by pollution, it looks a little something like this. It looks like it was built out of nature. And as you're looking around and taking all this greenery and beauty in, you're feeling like you don't even want to press the time machine button, return button to go back into 2022. Unfortunately, this is not the future we're currently headed towards and the path we're going down. The path we're going down with our greenhouse gas emissions, we're actually headed towards the first scenario, scenario A. And if we want to avoid that future, if we wanna pick this future instead, 
there's a lot of things we need to change because humans pollute in a lot of different ways, whether that's from the cars that we drive to the clothes that we wear to these tiny computers we carry around in our pockets so that we can watch cat videos during our morning commute. All of it is way too much for one researcher to tackle all by herself. So I decided to focus on one thing and one thing only. And I decided to focus on something rather big. I decided to focus on our buildings because our buildings are actually really, really bad for the environment. The building and construction industry right now is responsible for 40% of our worldwide greenhouse gas emissions each year. And the materials we're building out of are the main culprits. Materials like concrete and steel produce a lot of carbon dioxide emissions when we manufacture them. And so they are one of the main, pro, uh, one of the main culprits in all of our greenhouse gas emissions. And so, when we're looking at a building made out of concrete and we want to see how it's doing in terms of its environmental impact, we can use something called a carbon footprint to help us measure how much it's contributing to climate change and global warming. And so with a carbon footprint, what we do is we take all of the materials that go into the building. For example, we have concrete and steel going into this building and we see how much carbon dioxide, how many greenhouse gas emissions were polluted during the manufacturing of these materials. And that includes everything from the mining of the raw materials to the transportation, to the production facility, to the manufacturing of the materials itself. And so unfortunately our concrete and steel buildings have really high carbon footprints. And so you might be thinking, well, Christina, you're a scientist. Why don't you just whip up some new material in your lab that can reduce, that has lower carbon footprints? I like the way you're thinking, but in cases like this, I like to take a more natural approach. I like to go to the forest. Forests on this planet are incredible. They have been supporting us since the very first day that humans came around. They have provided us with shelter from predators, uh, with food to eat in the understory, and with wood to build our structures out of. And they also act as our planet's lungs. If the planet was the human body, the forest would be the lungs because they make the air for us to breathe. And how this works is that trees through their leaves take up carbon dioxide and then they convert it into oxygen. And so if we take this down to an individual tree level and let's say we take a seed and we plant it in the ground um, and with a little bit of water and a little bit of sunlight, the seed will sprout up and out comes a sprout. And the sprout with the help of the water and the sunlight will then take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It'll suck it down in through its leaves and then convert the carbon dioxide into sugars, which it can then store in its, in its stem and its leaves. And it continues doing this as it grows throughout its entire life cycle. It continues to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, continues to store it long-term in the trunk and in the leaves. And this will happen up to the point that the tree dies, whether that's from maybe lightning strikes it or maybe it's burned in a wildfire, blown over in a windstorm. If the log is still standing, if the tree trunk is still standing after, then the carbon that was locked up as sugars in the trunk is still stored in that tree. It's not until the log falls down and starts being decomposed by all the little critters and bugs and soil microbes um, that start munching on it. It's not until that point that the carbon that was previously a sugar is now released back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. You'll notice that this is a balanced equation through the tree's life cycle. The amount of carbon dioxide that was taken up while the tree was alive is the amount equal to the amount of carbon that is released by the tree after it dies. And so what does this mean for our buildings? So, oops. Apologies, there we go, had a bit of a lag. So if we're looking at our buildings, if we harvest a couple of trees, take them out of the forest and we take them to a sawmill and then transform them and manufacture them into a wood product such as lumber, then the carbon that was stored in the forest in those trees is now stored in the lumber. And if we take that lumber and then we put that lumber in a building, the carbon is now stored in the building. Furthermore, this frees up more room in the forest for more trees to grow in the place of the trees we harvested. And those trees can, the new trees can now pull additional carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, store in the forest and allow us to keep harvesting and keep creating more wood products. And so through doing this, we are moving carbon from the forest into our buildings. So how does this compare to our original scenario? The original scenario that we're currently doing when we're building out of concrete and steel. 
Well, we have two benefits that happen when we do this. The first being that we're storing carbon physically in the building. And the second being that our buildings made out of wood have lower carbon footprints than our buildings made out of concrete and steel because the manufacture of wood products such as lumber produces less carbon dioxide emissions than the manufacture of equivalent products like concrete and steel. So now you might be thinking, okay, great, Christina. We can build buildings out of wood. What else is new? We've been doing this for the past hundred, if not thousands of years. And you're correct, we have been doing this and building our buildings out of wood for a very long time. But we have been limited in how big we can make our buildings because the building materials that we've had in the past made out of wood have not been strong enough or big enough to build tall buildings, to build skyscrapers out of. But that has changed because now we have come up with a new product called cross laid timber or CLT. Now, CLT is made with the same way, in the same way that you might construct with Legos when you were a kid. So if you have your Legos and you have a bunch of little Legos, but you want to build a really tall tower, what you might do is you might take one little piece and then take a second little piece on top and then keep stacking, stacking, stacking until you end up with your big tower. cross laid timber is built in the same way that we start with a layer of lumber going in one direction, and then we stack a second layer of lumber on top of it in a perpendicular direction, and we can continue this pattern, stacking, 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 until we end up with anything that is three to five to seven layers thick. And since lumber does not have those little notches that hurt like heck when you step on them, uh, instead of just pressing it together and ending up with your wood product, you have to press it together and then glue it together with resins to end up with your finished product. So when we do this, we end up with a product that is really, really strong due to the perpendicular stacking, a product that is really lightweight because it's made out of wood, and a product that is even fireproof and fire resistant because it is really large, really thick, so it burns really slowly. And also it's coated with resins, which help it become more fire resistant. And we can use this cross laid timber uh, in massive, massive panels and beams in our buildings. And we can place them in the structural elements of the building, such as your columns, which run perpendicularly, or your beams, which run horizontally. Or you can put it in non-structural places like your walls, your floors, or your ceilings. And in all of these places, it's replacing non-wood materials like concrete and steel. And current building codes have allowed us to build up to 18 stories tall with wood. And this building right here is Miostorna. It's located in Norway. It is the world's largest wood building. It is a whopping 280 feet tall or 85 meters. And so while a building like this is really cool to look at and really exciting when you think about all that carbon that's locked up in there, forest researchers, forest researchers such as myself get a little worried looking at all that wood, thinking about where did that wood come from? It came from the forest. And what happens if we build more buildings out of wood in the future? What is that gonna mean for our forests? So if we're gonna keep doing this, we need to make sure that we're not over harvesting. And when I say over harvesting, I mean take more wood than what grows each year. This is a huge problem that can lead to a bunch of smaller problems across the landscape, such as poor soil health. If you remove the trees that are supporting the and holding the soil together, the soil can start to erode and degrade, and it might even leach into the rivers and pollute the rivers. Uh, and this can have consequences for the wildlife that lives in the river, such as fish, or even the wildlife that lives and depends near the river. And then across the landscape as well, you might notice that all of these trees that are now gone, all the animals that were supported by those trees and living under them, depending on them for shelter and for food, now have lost their habitat. And this might lead to biodiversity loss or the number of different animal species present on the landscape. And this can also impact human communities who depend on the forest for recreational values or cultural uses. And so to make sure that we're not over harvesting, we need to make sure we're harvesting sustainably. And when I say sustainably, that means we're not cutting more each year than what grows. We need to make sure that a forest on average on a net is growing. And so currently right now in the United States, our harvests are sustainable. The amount of forest that grows each year is way, way more than the amount of forest that is cut each year. 
And future studies have actually, or studies have actually predicted what this might look like with a future demand of cross-laminated timber. Uh, they predicted how much growth will happen, how much we'll need to harvest if we're using more cross-laminated timber, and what this might look like in the United States as a whole, and then in the north, south, and west regions as well. And as you can see in the green portions of the of this graph, the green portions representing the growth, they're greater than the yellow portions, the amount that we need to harvest or cut. And so this means that uh, under a scenario of increased uh, harvest due to an increased demand of cross native timber, we still won't be harvesting too much. But we need a backup plan because this uh, this method this method does not take into account uh, the effects of wildfire or other natural disasters that might wipe out large areas of forest. And if this happens, we need to make sure that we can still continue harvesting trees to make wood products and make cross native timber. And so if we're thinking about this problem and wanting to make sure that we still have a decent supply of wood for our for our timber buildings, we might need to start rethinking the way that we produce products. And so right now, our economy is a linear economy. It's built on the principle that we take a material from the environment, we make it into a product, and then we use it once and dispose of it, which is quite wasteful if you think about it. What we could be doing instead is we could take a material from the environment, make it into a product, use that product, and then if it's in good enough condition, we can recycle it or we can even reuse it. And then that would be our source. We wouldn't need to take any more money material from the environment. And if we're able to continue this circle for as long as possible, it would reduce the amount that we would need to take from the environment. And so how this fits into cross timber is if we take a look at Neosorna, let's pretend that we're looking at it 80 years in the future. Um, and it's predicted that most of the wood in this building is actually going to be still in good condition at the end of the building's life, as are most wood products at the end of the building's life. We could do several things. If the best CLT, the best condition CLT could be reused into a new building, we could chip down the CLT and make it into particle board. Particle board being uh, something you might find in your desks or in your cabinets. It's not quite as strong as CLT, but it's still a very useful and valuable product. We could also take those wood chips after chipping down CLT and we could incinerate it and use that as bioenergy. And when we're doing this, we're replacing fossil fuels. Or if it's not in good condition at all and we need to throw it away, then we would put it in the landfill if we have to. And so with my research, what I'm doing is I'm looking at these different building profiles. I'm looking at an eight-story building, a 12-story building, and an 18-story building, all made out of, of um, cross-laminated timber. What I'm doing is I'm determining what percent of the cross-laminated timber in this building needs to be reused, what percent should be recycled, incinerated, or landfilled. And then, based on these different scenarios, I'm trying to figure out what I call a carbon profile of the scenario. So the carbon profile takes into account two different kinds of emissions. We have our red emissions and we have our green emissions. The red emissions corresponding to our carbon dioxide emissions, what is released into the atmosphere during this reprocessing of reuse, and then the green emissions referring to the benefit we get from storing that carbon in the building. And so this is different for all these different scenarios. So for something like reuse and recycle, the carbon dioxide emissions are quite similar because the process, reprocessing is quite similar where you, um, you take the mass the cross native timber and you drive it from the destructed building to a reprocessing facility, then you cut it down and reshape it or you chip it down and recycle it. Um, so that produces similar carbon dioxide emissions. Or you might incinerate it, and if you incinerate it, you end up with higher emissions because you're burning the wood and that produces a lot of emissions. Whereas if you landfill it, um, the carbon that was in the wood product slowly gets degraded and slowly gets decomposed out back into the atmosphere, just like it was in the forest as a decomposing log. Now, if we're looking at the carbon stored, it tells a different story as well. So something like cross-laminated timber, which gets reused into more cross-laminated timber, still has a lot of carbon stored in it. It's a really large wood product, and there is a lot of carbon per unit of wood locked up in there. However, if you're looking at something like carbon CLT being recycled into particle board, particle board is a much smaller and less dense product that actually has a lot less carbon stored per unit of wood. So it has a smaller green portion. 
And then if you're looking at incineration, there's all the wood was burned, so there is no carbon left there. But landfilling has quite a surprising amount of carbon still stored because um, it's buried underground in a landfill and uh, most of the carbon actually gets permanently stored there. And so when we're looking at all of these different building profiles, what we're trying to do is add up the red portion to the green portion to figure out which of these scenarios does best uh, in terms of its climate change impact. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to treat our cross-linear timber at the end of life in a way that it has the most green portion or the most carbon storage and the smallest red portion, the smallest emissions associated with it. And so if we put this all together and we use uh, wood to build our buildings and we're able to store carbon in our buildings, we're able to make buildings with lower carbon footprints, and we're able to recycle, reprocess our um, cross laned timber at the end of the life to make sure we have enough in our wood supply without depleting our forests, and make sure that we're treating them in ways that can um, be beneficial to our climate, then we have a better chance at ending up with this as our future. Because this future is a win-win scenario. It's a win for us and it's a win for nature. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Christina. Um, and I'd now like to introduce our final speaker of the evening, Arena Manning who is a PhD student in the graduate program in neuroscience at UW. By analyzing brain activity and imaging the brain, Arena studies the role that different interneurons, which is a type of neuron play in mediating epilepsy. Please join me in welcoming our final speaker, Arena. Thanks, Kevin. So imagine this, it's a Saturday night, you're on your couch, Snacks on the left, companion on the right. Your feet are propped up and you're watching a long awaited TV show. <sighs> Halfway to the show, there's a long commercial break. And since you don't feel like getting up, you just sit through them. One commercial comes on and it's of a drug that says it helps with epilepsy. But soon enough, the narrator spends most of the time describing the side effects of the drug. And this list is so long that you forget what the drug was supposed to help with in the first place. Then you have a moment of clarity thinking as tune, moment of clarity as you tune the commercial out, thinking, why do these commercials always end with a long laundry list of side effects? And you may be even wondering, what's it gonna take to one day develop treatments that target the disease without this extra baggage? Well, the easy answer is to make better drugs, but of course that's too simple. Before we can think about making better drugs, we first need to understand the disease. I study epilepsy, which is a common brain disorder that causes catastrophic damage to the brain. And even though we know that epilepsy damages the brain, it remains unclear exactly how this happens. And so to understand epilepsy and really any disorder of the brain, neuroscientists build models of the brain. And so in the same way that architects build miniature models of buildings that they, seek, that, that they wanna construct, Neuroscientists build models of diseases that we seek to understand better. To build beautiful homes, architects first have to design and create smaller structures in order to anticipate problems that could arise, such as where weak points may occur. And if they do find any problems, they can come up with solutions and address them way before the heavy lifting of construction starts. And so similarly, neuroscientists build and study smaller models of the brain where we can investigate the mouse brain. And we, use, and we investigate the mouse brain in order to understand how larger structures such as our own brains work. And since we can't test out our new ideas at the experimental stage on people, as this would be unethical, we test these ideas on animals. And then using animals to model how we think diseases of the brain work, we can not only, only understand uh, fundamental principles of the brain, but also make sure that treatments are safe and effective, which will ultimately lead to the development of therapies that will eventually help people. To build animal models of diseases, there are three key, what I'm calling pit stops, that we can consider, or that we should consider, in order to eventually develop better drugs. So let's take a first, let's take a look at this first pit stop. 
the main type of ner nerve cell in your brain is called a neuron. And there are nearly a hundred billion of them in your brain. This is a number that's really difficult to grasp, but to help you appreciate the enormity of this number, you can remember that there are about as many neurons in your brain as there are stars in our galaxy, the Milky, the Milky Way depicted here. The second pit stop is that there are different types of neurons. So here's an illustration depicting many of the different types of cell in your eye, which is part of the brain. You can see that there's quite a diversity of shapes and sizes among these neurons, where some neurons are stretching out really, really wide and other neurons are stretching out really, really tall. Finally, every neuron contains DNA. DNA is considered the vital, vital blueprint of the cell. It provides really important instructions on how to do all sorts of things, such as how to communicate. And this is particularly important for neurons because neurons are communicating all the time. This red arrow is outlining a neuron, whereas the thicker blue arrow is pointing to DNA, which every neuron has. Using these three pit stops, my research entails building and studying models of disease to understand how to eventually treat the brain. And creating models of diseases entails incorporating three main components. And so for the rest of the talk, I'll guide you through these three points. So first we're, we'll discuss what's gone wrong in the brain or what are the noticeable differences between what's considered healthy from what's considered diseased or dysfunctional. Then we'll talk about how, do, how I created a model. And for this, we'll return to the handy dandy roadmap and go over those three pit stops again, but now in the context of my research. And then finally, I'll wrap up by describing how I've studied these models, or one of them in particular, to determine how accurate the model is in representing the, or to, yeah, to determine how accurate the model is in representing the disease or what we've said has gone wrong. Together, these three components will reveal how epilepsy damages the brain, which eventually is key to figuring out how to treat it. So again, I study epilepsy, which is a common brain disorder affecting about 1% of the population. Epilepsy is defined as having spontaneous and repeated seizures. And when people think of seizures, they tend to think of someone who loses consciousness and um, uncontrollably moves their body and they may be even convulsing. So this is one type of seizure that I study. There are different injuries such as stroke and even infections that can cause epilepsy. But I study a very specific type of epilepsy that's caused by damage to one's DNA, a genetic epilepsy. And the type of genetic epilepsy I study is called Lay syndrome. Lay syndrome is caused by mutations in genes that prevent the cell from producing energy and what we think is leading to epilepsy. One gene that causes Lay syndrome is called NDUFS4. And you can ask me what that stands for later, but for now you can just remember that it's a gene that makes a really key and important protein within our mitochondria. And mitochondria are considered the powerhouse of the cell. And pretty much every cell in your body, especially your neurons, depend on this gene to make energy. So in a healthy condition, the NDUFS4 gene, it gets made into its protein, which I'm depicting here as this pur purple blob. And this protein, this NDUFS4 protein is found abundantly in your mitochondria. And it's this protein among others that allows our happy and healthy mitochondria to produce energy, in fact, a lot of it. And neurons can then use this energy to communicate with one another which they love to do and they do it all the time. And this makes for a healthy brain. However, in a disease condition, the NDOS4 gene contains a mutation. The mutation prevents the protein from getting made. And so now it's missing. Without this vital protein, mitochondria become dysfunctional and they can't produce enough energy. And this, loss of energy or this low energy prevents our neurons from communicating with one another. And so this is what we think is leading to the epilepsy.
So how do I create models of epilepsy, specifically models of Lay syndrome epilepsy? Well, now let's return to my handy dandy roadmap and review those pit stops again, but now in the context of my research. So let's talk about those neurons again. The human brain contains 100 billion neurons. And if we want our model to capture this level of complexity, we need to turn to a system that also contains a lot of cells. And so as I alluded to before, researchers, including myself, we turn to the mouse brain, which includes about 70 million neurons. So still a complicated system, but now slightly less daunting. And so there are different types of neurons in the brain. One way neurons are different from one another is by the way that they communicate. For instance, there are neurons that excite other cells. These cells are called excitatory cells and they help produce what we call excitation. You can think of these cells as chatty cathies. They're the people in your life that love to talk and can always seem to seamlessly keep the conversation going. Then there are neurons that inhibit other cells called interneurons. These cells, these, help, these cells help produce what we call inhibition. You can think of these cells as the people in your life who also enjoy talking, but can appreciate moments of silence as well. And channeling their inner librarian spirits, interneurons quiet signals generated by the excitatory cells. And to do this, they have to use a lot of energy, making them particularly reliant on their mitochondria. Not only are these cells different in terms of behavior or how they communicate, but also in how many there are. So inner neurons are considered to be far, far outnumbered. They make up about only 10 to 20% of all your neurons in the brain. And so they have to use a lot of energy all the time. Again, making them highly reliant on generating energy or highly reliant on their mitochondria. So essentially, inner neurons are working extremely hard to prevent the brain from becoming too loud. And therefore, the brain relies on these cells to help maintain balance in the brain. And it's important for your brain to maintain an equal balance of excitation and inhibition. And you can think of this as a scale where on one side there's excitation and the other inhibition. So a healthy brain contains equal parts of excitation and inhibition. But in an epileptic brain, and what we also think occurs in Lay syndrome patients, the brain has way too much excitation, not enough inhibition, which throws off this delicate balance and it leaves the brain susceptible to epilepsy. Finally, every neuron contains DNA. So again, DNA is the vital blueprint of the cell and it contains this long genetic list, contains a list of long genetic instructions where each cell has a copy. And then genes are smaller pieces of DNA, which you can think of as specific guidelines where each cell has different, where different cell has different guidelines. And proteins, which come from these genes, are the tangible changes that take place. And so they determine the identity of the neuron and how it behaves, such as how it may communicate. And so knowing that different neurons contain different genes and therefore different proteins, researchers can use powerful genetic tools to target specific types of neurons. And so in order to understand how Lay syndrome causes epilepsy, I can place this endospore mutation in different types of neurons and then study the consequences. So more specifically, I can place this mutated endospore gene, which leads to the missing endospore protein, and then dysfunctional mitochondria. And then I can decide, should I place it into, or what happens when I place it into the chatty cathies? or these excitatory cells? What happens when I place it into the interneurons, which are considered the quiet cells? And my, my big question is, does this brain become susceptible to epilepsy? Does it become susceptible to something else? 
So after placing the MDOS4 mutation in these different types of neurons, what did I learn or what did we learn? What have these models told us? Well, one model told us that epilepsy arises only when we place the MDOS4 mutation in interneurons. In fact, mice with this mutation saw a severe epilepsy. And it's a similar form of epilepsy that also occurs in play syndrome patients. And so we think that this is driven by that imbalance of excitation and inhibition, where there's way too much excitation and not enough inhibition. And so it seems like we have a good working model of the epilepsy. We've been able to incorporate what we know about the complexity of the brain and capture what's gone wrong. Or in other words, we've been able to figure out what makes the brain dysfunctional, specifically in Lay syndrome epilepsy. So the next vital question was, well, how does this imbalance of excitation and inhibition occur? What's happening to these interneurons during development? And we found that after some time in development, interneurons with the NDS4 mutation were becoming dysfunctional and, there was, and it also led to cell loss. So they went missing. So without these interneurons no longer able to quiet those chatty cathies, the brain became way too loud and susceptible to epilepsy. And further, one of the first things that I discovered in the lab was cell loss or these missing cells or the occurrence of the missing cells were, were occurring in brains where interneurons had this NDS4 mutation. And to demonstrate this, I took a lot of images of the brain and I took, and I took them under two conditions. The first condition was where every cell, including these quiet, um, quiet cells or the interneurons had healthy copies of the NDS4 gene. And so in this condition, every cell had this healthy mitochondria and could produce enough energy. And in the second condition, every interneuron now had mutated copies of the NDF4 gene, leading to this the dysfunctional mitochondria of which can no longer produce enough energy. And I found that after placing this NDF4 gene in every single interneuron, this led to cell loss. And here I'm highlighting especially where I think I'm thinking that the cell loss is occurring. And so I've been able to show that I detected about a 30% reduction of these interneurons in a region in the brain called the hippocampus, which is a key area in the, in the brain that's known to contribute to epilepsy. And so building off of that previous research, and in order to further our understanding of the role of interneuron dysfunction in epilepsy, my central dissertation research question became, is the end of four mutation leaving all interneurons dysfunctional and leading to this cell loss? Perhaps we can pin down an even smaller population of cells that are key to producing this epilepsy. So to do this, I'm investigating two main interneuron subtypes. The first type of interneuron that I'm investigating are called parvalbumin or PV interneurons. And that's depicted here in green. And then in orange here, I'm, I'm also, I'm showing that I'm investigating somatostatin or SST interneurons. And there's many different ways that you can uh, distinguish these two types of interneurons. Uh, one primary way is how active they are. And so, we know that parvalbumin cells are very, very active. They send a lot of signals to other cells, and so they're, they're, um, yeah, they're just very active. And in order to sustain this high activity, these cells have a huge appetite. And so similar to the way that the cookie monster, who can devour a seemingly endless number of cookies, PV interneurons can easily burn through large amounts of energy, making them particularly reliant on mitochondria. And then in contrast, some statin cells or SST cells aren't as active, and in short, they more or less take their time when consuming energy, so they have a moderate appetite. Starting with the PV interneurons, my main question was, after placing the endos mutation in only PV interneurons, will this lead to epilepsy? To answer this question, what I did was recorded brain activity. And to do this, I placed these small devices that were sitting right on top of the skull and recorded activity that's mostly coming from a region of the brain called the cortex, which sits just underneath the skull. And then I had two uh, conditions. 
The first was when the MDOS4 mutation was healthy in not only the PV interneurons, but every single neuron in the brain. And here I'm showing you traces from one mouse, one representative mouse. So the top trace is of the left side of the brain. The middle trace is the, the right side of the brain. And then I'm also looking at uh, how the mouse moves, which is a way that it can further characterize types of seizures that may or may not occur. And after looking at this, this healthy condition, I, know, I've, I noticed that the, brain, that the brains were fairly normal. So they were brain activity, nothing was jumping out. But then under the second condition, when I um, introduced this or placed this mutation in only the PV interneurons, so only the uh, cookie monster interneurons, I noticed that these mice were showing seizures. And so I'm highlighting that here, and I'm outlining in that box um, where the seizure occurred. And so the central finding of these experiments was that after I placed the NDOS4 mutation in only these PV interneurons, this led to seizures. And so therefore I can in fact pin down a smaller population of interneurons that are driving the epilepsy. So now you may be wondering the big question, well, so what, what does this all mean? How does this actually improve future treatments? Well, with tr traditional treatment approaches, the drug targets every single cell. So that's cells that are dysfunctional and cells that are um, healthy. And this is what we think leads to unwanted side effects. But with novel and upcoming treatment approaches, rather than creating drugs that target every single cell, the goal is to target only the cells that are dysfunctional. So in the case of Blaze syndrome, I would, we would only be targeting PV interneurons. And the aim for novel treatment approaches is to treat the disease in addition to avoiding those unwanted side effects. And while my research stops at studying disease models, I hope that my work will contribute to developing a new generation of drugs that can only target the cells that are actually causing the epilepsy. And perhaps we can provide these PV interneurons with the energy that they desperately need, which will help restore balance in the brain without the extra batch. And I'd love to acknowledge members of my lab, um, as well as graduate program in neuroscience at Seattle Children's, and thank you for your time. Wonderful, thank you so much, Arena. Um, and with that, I'd like to invite uh, our other two speakers back up to our virtual stage here, um, and we'll take some questions now from the audience. Um, and please remember to submit uh, your questions for our speakers using that link we put up at the beginning. Um, and we have a few here to start us out. Um, so it looks like one for uh, Lauren. And the question is, do the estimated TV incidence rates you showed include latent cases or only active cases? That is a really good question. I think it is both in that graph. Um, and I didn't quite get into the weeds of latent TB versus active TB. But for anybody who doesn't know, I'll just explain that really quickly. Um, a lot of people can get TB. I think it's like one in four people get latent TB. And it's what's called an opportunistic infection. And so it, the latent TB, you don't show any symptoms. But eventually it can turn into active TB. And that's like the actual disease that I talk about. So latent TB you test for with the skin prick and active TB you test for with the phlegm. Um, but TB incidence overall was, was illustrated in that map. So latent plus active TB, uh, those numbers I think that I presented are for all of, of them. Yeah, that's my answer. Awesome, thanks Lauren. Um, and a question now for Arena. Um, so you showed that brain activity recording device. Um, and the question is, can you talk a little bit more about how that device works? Sure. So essentially I'm placing two electrodes that are sitting right above the cortex. And um, I'm also recording, I'm also placing electrodes other other places. So I have what it's called a ground electrode, and then I have a reference electrode. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm trying to cancel out all extra noise because I'm really trying to focus in on brain activity. Um, and yeah, so I'm essentially picking up on all the activity that thousands and thousands and thousands of neurons are 
emitting um, um, and I'm picking that up from this um, the cortex and then I can pick up a little bit of signal from just underneath the cortex and the hippocampus of what like I mentioned um, earlier. Yeah. Awesome, thanks so much, Arena. Um, and here's one for uh, Christina. Um, and the question is, are there other uses of cross laminated timber besides buildings? Yeah, that's a great question. and One I love to answer. Um, yeah, cross laminated timber can be used in all sorts of construction product uh, projects. It's most common in our buildings, but I've also seen it be used in like stadiums and bridges. Um, I think just even Googling cross laminated timber bridges uh, can yield some pretty cool results. There's a lot of really cool things that architects are doing with it. Great, thanks, Christina. Um, and it looks like this one is also for Lauren. Um, and it says, what methods can be used to improve the accuracy of the test? And how accurate is it currently? That is the million dollar question for sure. Um, and there's a lot of different answers. Um, and so different people in the lab are working on what's called optimizing the different methods from kind of different approaches. So there's working on making the PCR better. There's working on the swabbing method. Um, there's just a lot of things to understand. Um, in terms of the precise sensitivity and specificity, I can't give you an, a super accurate number because it's not standardized yet. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head the comparison for the other methods, um, but hopefully by the time it is rolled out in practice, it is more sensitive and specific than we have it right now. And so that's one of the things I'm working on with my own data is kind of assessing the sensitivity and specificity of the oral swabs, um, especially as people are on treatment. So that's kind of some in-progress research. So I don't have like a, a super great answer. Um, was that all of the parts of the question? I can't remember. Um, yeah, I think you uh, hit it all. It said, how accurate is it currently? And I guess what methods can be used to improve the accuracy of the test? Yeah, so like I said, I think it, I think it has both to do with like the way we detect uh, the DNA uh, with the PCR. There's some, some method stuff that could happen there and how we get the DNA off of it, how we concentrate it, et cetera. So I think there are all places uh, in that process that could help make it more accurate. So that's what we do in the lab. Uh, all of us is work on different pieces of it to make it more accurate ultimately. Awesome, thanks so much, Lauren. Um, and since we're about to kind of wrap things up here, I'm going to throw in um, one big qu picture question for you all. Um, since Engage is, is all about science communication and outreach, um, how about you each wrap us up with just a couple words about why you like doing what you do, why, why you go to the lab every day? Um, and we can start with Arena. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think ultimately is to help people. So um, when I go into the lab, just the, just thinking about how my research can ultimately lead to development of a new drug, um, I think is gonna be worthwhile and it, and it feels like it's worthwhile. Um, there's so many drugs out there that could be improved. And there's also so many diseases out there that we don't even have um, treatments for. We just have kind of palliative uh, treatment or therapies for, but it's not actually curing the disease. Um, and so, yeah, if, if my work can lead to the development of an actual treatment that um, gets rid of um, epilepsy, I guess, in my case, um, which can be really de uh, debilitating, I think that's, um, that's a huge motivator for me. Awesome. Thanks so much. What great motivation. Um, Lauren, I choose you. That's a great question. Um, I love what I do. I love public health. Um, I think it's really evident uh, these days why public health is so important and why diagnostics are important. I think that a lot of us really intimately understand the frustration of diagnostic tests and when they don't work and when they take a long time. Um, so it's really an important process in infectious disease research and just disease research in general is making sure people get diagnosed correctly and making sure that people's treatments are working effectively so that people can get better. 
um, and making sure that that process happens kind of as painlessly um, and quickly as possible, I think is really uh, an exciting place to be. Um, and just more generally, just in the public health space, it's really uh, an exciting time as a positive, not to put a positive spin on it, but it is an exciting time for um, public health and infectious disease research. I hope to see more of a paradigm shift uh, with public health um, funding and just general science knowledge about public health. So I really enjoy um, this kind of work and science communications and bringing the research into the community because the research uh, deserves the community or the research, the community deserves the research. Sorry. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh, Christina, go ahead. Yeah. So if you can't tell from my background and, you know, just my research in general, I love I love the forest. I love trees, everything about them. Um, it's always been a very like soothing, comforting place for me. If I feel like I ever need like a, just like a mental health reset, um, my favorite place to go is into the woods. Um, and the thing I think I find most exciting about my research is that it's helping bring nature into our communities and into our like living spaces, the places like we work, play and breathe and live. Um, uh, it's there's been like a couple of studies that have you know looked into the effect of having like a more natural setting like a like like healing in a wood room versus healing in like a concrete room. Um, there's a couple in Norway that I really enjoy looking at. It's like they have these hospitals set up in in the forest, like overlooking like pretty much what looks like my background, like in these like wood buildings. Um, and the like the recovery rates are just like so much faster, and the like sense of well-being people get is insane compared to like a regular, you know, concrete like room looking out over, you know, a cityscape. Um, and I think building with more like natural materials also helps us, you know, when we have nature around us helps us improve our relationship to nature. I think one of the really big drivers of the climate crisis that we're facing is that people have lost touch with the natural environment. It's a relationship that is deeply like wounded and fractured and needs repairing. If we want to continue to live on this planet, we need to be more sustainable and we need to be respectful of the earth we live on. Um, and it, it feels good to be doing research that could help us, you know, get on the right path and um, live sustainably with nature. Thank you so much to all three of you. Um, and that is about all we have for you tonight. Thank you for everyone in our virtual audience who joined us this evening. Uh, and thank you again for our three excellent speakers. I'm sure we've all given you a virtual round of applause here. Um, all of our speakers tonight are part of Engage, which is a graduate student organization at the University of Washington uh, that focuses on training fellow graduate students in science communication. If you'd like to learn more about the Engage program, please check us out on social media at Engage Science or online at engage-science.space. And finally, if you liked what you saw here tonight, please join us one week from today in person at Town Hall or virtually live streamed for our final event of the season, where we'll hear from three more students about how robots can explain lung cancer, about representations of native peoples in the media, and about using bubbles to treat cancer. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great night.